Ashley Brock, reading Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 3. Need bunny, too. Okay, baby, we'll get your bunny. It was, Grace thought, always an expedition. They were only going as far as the sandbox in the backyard, but Aubrey never failed to demand that all her stuffed pals accompany her. Grace had solved this logical problem with an enormous shopping bag. Inside it were a bear, two dogs, a fish, and a very tattered cat. The bunny joined them. Though Grace's eyes were gritty from lack of sleep, she grinned broadly as Aubrey tried to heave the bag or so. I'll carry them, honey. No, me! It was Grace. It was Grace Aubrey's favorite phrase. Her baby liked to do things herself, even when it would be simpler to let someone else do the job. Wonder where she gets that from. Grace mused and laughed at both of them. Okay, let's get the crew outside. <clears throat> she opened the screen door. It squeaked badly, reminding her that she needed to oil the hinges, and waited while Aubrey dragged the bag over the threshold and onto the tiny back porch. Grace had livened up the porch by painting it a soft blue and added clay pots filled with pink and white garaminos. In her mind, the little rental house was temporary, but she didn't want it to feel temporary. She wanted it to feel like home, at least until she saved enough money for a down payment or a place of their own. Inside, the room sizes were on the stingy side, but she solved that and helped her bank balance by keeping furniture to a minimum. Most of what she had were yard sale bargains, but she painted, refinished, recovered, and turned every piece into her own. It was vital to Grace to have her own. The house had ancient plumbing, a roof that leaked water after a rain, and windows that leaked air. But it had two bedrooms, which had been essential. She wanted her daughter to have a room of her own, a bright, cheerful room. She had seen to that, papering the walls herself, painting the trim, adding fuzzy curtains. It was already breaking her heart, knowing that it was about time to dismantle Aubrey's crib and replace it with a youth bed. Be careful on the steps, Grace warned, and Aubrey started down. Both tiny tennis shoes planted themselves firmly on each of, of the steps on the descent. The minute she hit bottom, she began to run, dragging her bag behind her and squealing in anticipation. She loved the sandbox and made Grace pr proud to watch Aubrey make her traditional beeline for it. Grace had built it herself, using scrap lumber that she meticulously sanded smooth and painted it a bright Corina Corolla crown red and it were the pails and shovels and big plastic cars but she knew aubrey would touch none of them until she set out her pets one day grace promised herself aubrey would have a real puppy in a playroom so that she could have friends visit and spend long rainy afternoons grace crouched down as aubrey placed her toys careful in the white sand you sit right in here and play while i mow the lawn promise Okay, Aubrey beamed up at her dimples when you play in a little while. She shook Aubrey's curls. She could never get enough of touching this miracle that had come from her. Before rising, she looked around, mother's eyes scanning for any trouble. The yard was fenced, and she had installed a childproof lock on the gate herself. Aubrey tended to be curious. A flowering vine rambled along the fence that bordered her house in the cutters and would have it burn and would have it buried in bloom by summer's end no one was staring next door she noted too early on sunday morning for her neighbors to be doing more than lazing about and thinking of breakfast julie cutter the eldest daughter of the house was her much treasured babysitter she noted that julie's mother irene had spent some time in her garden the day before not a single weed there showed its head in irene cutter's flowers or in her vegetable patch with some embarrassment grace glanced toward the rear of her yard where she and aubrey had planted some tomatoes and beans and carrots plenty of weeds there she thought with a sigh she'd have to deal with that after cutting the lawn god only knew why she thought she would have time to tend to a garden but it had been such fun to dig the dirt and plant the seeds with her little girl just as it would be so fun to step into the sandbox and build castles and make up games no you don't grace ordered herself and rose the lawn was nearly ankle deep it might have been rented grass, but it was hers now and her responsibility. No one was going to say that Grace Monroe couldn't tend her own. She kept the ancient second-hand lawnmower under an equally ancient drop cloth. As usual, she checked the gas level first, casting another glance over her shoulder. To be certain, Aubrey was still tucked in the sandbox. Gripping the starter cord with both hands, she yanked and got a whizzing cough in response. Come on, don't mess with me this morning. She lost count of the time she fiddled and repaired and banged on the old machine, rolling her 
protesting shoulders. She yanked again, then a third time, before letting the cord snap back and press her fingers to rest. Wouldn't you just know it? Giving you trouble. Her head jerked around. After their argument that before, Ethan was the last person Grace expected to see standing in her backyard. Didn't please her, particularly since she told herself she could and would stay mad at him. Worse, she knew how she looked. Old gray shorts and a t-shirt that had seen too many washings, not a stitch of makeup on it or hair on comb. Damn it, she dressed for yard work, not for company. I can handle it. She yanked again, her foot clad in a sneaker with a hole in the toe, planted it on the side of the machine, nearly caught. Very nearly. Let it rest a minute. You're just going to flood it. This time the cord snapped back with a dangerous hiss. I know how to start my own lawnmower. I imagine you do when you're not mad. He walked over as he spoke, all lean and easy male with faded jeans and a work shirt rolled up to his elbows. He had come around back when she didn't answer her door, and he, know, he knew he stood watching her a little longer than was strictly polite. She had such a pretty way of moving. He had decided sometime during the restless night that he had better find a way to make amends, and he spent a good part of his morning trying to figure out how to do so. Then he'd seen her, all those long, slim limbs, the sun was turning pale gold, the sunny, the sunny hair, the narrow head, hands, and he just wanted to watch for a bit. <laughs> I'm not mad, she said in an impatient hiss that proved her statement a lie. He only looked into her eyes. Listen, Grace... Ethan! With a shriek of pure pleasure, Aubrey scrambled out of the sandbox and ran to him, full out, arms extended, face lit up with joy. Caught her, swung her up and around. Hey there, Aubrey. Come play. Well, um, kiss! She puckered her little lips with such energy that he had to laugh and give him a friendly peck. Okay! She wiggled down and ran back to her sandbox. Look, Grace... I'm sorry if I was out of line last night. <laughs> the fact that her heart had melted when he held her daughter only made her more determined to stand firm. If? He shifted his feet, clearly and cold. I just meant that. <laughs> his explanation was interrupted as Aubrey ran back with her beloved stuffed out. Kiss, she stated very firmly and held him up to Ethan. He obliged, waiting until she raced away again. What I mean, what I meant was. I think you said what you met, Ethan. She was going to be stubborn. He thought with an inward sigh. Well, she always had been. I didn't say very well. I get tangled up with words most of the time. I hate to see you working so hard. He paused, patient, when Aubrey came back to making a kiss for her bear. I worry about you some, that's all. Grace angled her head. Why? Why? The question threw him. He bent to kiss the stuffed bunny that Aubrey batted against his leg. Well, I, because... Because I'm a woman, she suggested, because I'm a single parent, because my father considers that I smeared the family name by not only having to get married, but by getting myself divorced. No, he took a step closer to her, absolutely kissing the cat that Harvey held up to him. Because I've known you more than half my life, and that makes you part of it, and because maybe you're too stubborn or too proud to see when somebody just wants to see things go a little easier for you. She started to tell him she'd appreciate that, felt herself beginning to soften, then we were, because I didn't like seeing men paw at you. Paw at me? Her back went up, her chin went up. Men were not pawing at me, Ethan, and if they do, I know what to do about it. Don't get all riled up again. <laughs> Scratch his chin. Struggled not to sigh. He didn't see the point in arguing with a woman. You could never win. I came over here to tell you I was sorry, and so maybe I could... Kiss! Aubrey demanded and began to climb up his leg. Instinctively, Ethan pulled her up into his arms and kissed her cheek. I was going to say, No, kiss mama! Bouncing in his arms, Aubrey pushed at his lips to make them pucker. Kiss mama! Aubrey! Mortified, Grace reached for her daughter, only to have Aubrey cling to Ethan's shirt like a small golden blur. Leave Ethan alone! Changing tactics, Aubrey laid her head on Ethan's shoulder and smiled sweetly, one arm clinging like a vine around his neck as Grace tugged at her. Kiss! Mama! She cooed and batted her eyes at Ethan. Grace had laughed instead of looking so embarrassed, just a little nervous. Ethan thought he could have brushed his lips over her brow and settled the matter. But her cheeks had gone pink and so near she wouldn't meet his eyes, and her breath was unsteady. He watched her bite her bottom lip and decided he might as well settle the matter another way entirely. He laid a hand on Grace's shoulder, as Aubrey caught between them. This will be easier. He murmured and touched his lips lightly to hers. It wasn't easier. It rocked her heart. It could barely be considered a kiss. It was over almost before it began. It was nothing more than a quite quiet brush of the lips, an instant of taste and texture, and a whiff of promise that made her long, long, desperately, impossibly 
In all the years he'd known her, he had never touched his mouth to hers. Now, with just the, fleet, the fleeting sampling, he wondered why he waited so long, and worried that the wondering would change everything. Aubrey clapped her hands in glee, but he barely heard it. Grace's eyes were on his now, on his now, that misty swimming green, and her faces were close, close enough that he only had to ease forward a fraction if he wanted to taste again, to linger this time, he thought, as her lips parted on a trembling breath. No, me, Aubrey planted her small soft mouth on her mother's cheek. Then Ethan, come play. Grace jerked back like a puppet whose strings had been rudely yanked. The silky pink cloud that had begun to fog her brain evaporated. Soon, honey. Moving quickly now, she plucked Aubrey out of Ethan's arms and set her on her feet. Go on and build me a castle for us to live in. She gave Aubrey a gentle pat on the rope and sent her off at a run. Then she cleared her. You're awful good to her, Ethan. I appreciate it. He decided the best place for his hands, under the circumstances, was in his pockets. He wasn't sure what he'd do about the itchy feeling in them. She's a sweetheart. Deliberately, he turned to watch Aubrey in her red sandbox. In a handful, she needed to get her feet back under her grace, told herself, and to do what needed to be done next. Why don't we just forget last night, Ethan? I'm sure you meant it all for the best. Reality is just not always what we choose or what we'd like it to be. He turned back slowly in those quiet eyes of his focus on her face. What do you want it to be, Grace? What I want is for Aubrey to have a home and a family. I think I'm pretty close to that. So she said, no. What do you want for, Grace? Besides her? She looked over at her daughter and smiled. I don't even remember anymore. Right now I want my lawn mowed and my vegetables we did. I appreciate you coming by like this. She turned away and prepared to give the starter cord another yank. I'll be by the house tomorrow. She went very still when his hand closed over. I'll cut the grass. I can do it. She couldn't even start the damn lawnmower. He thought, but he was wise enough not to mention. I didn't say you couldn't. I said I'd do it. She couldn't turn around. Couldn't risk what it would be due to her system to be that close again face to face. You have chores of your own. Grace, are we going to stand here all day arguing over who's going to cut this grass? I could have it done twice over by the time we finish, and you could be saving your string beans from being choked out by those weeds. I was going to get to them. Her voice was thin. They were both bent over, all but spooned together. The flash of sheer animal lust that streaked through the familiar yearning for him staggered her. Get to them now, he murmured, and willing her to move. If she didn't, very quickly, he might not be able to hold himself back from putting his hands on her and putting them on her in a place they had no business being. All right, she shifted away, moving sideways while her heart nodded at her ribs in short rabbit punches. I appreciate it. Thanks. She bit her lip hard because she was going to babble, determined to be normal. She turned to smile. It's probably the carburetor again. I've got some tools. Say nothing. Ethan grabbed the cord with one hand, yanked it hard twice. The engine caught with a despotic, despotic roar. It ought to do. He said mildly when he saw her mouth and in frustration. Yeah, it ought to. Struggling not to be annoyed, she strode quickly to her vegetable patch and bent over. Ethan thought as he began to cut the first watch. Bent over in those thin cotton shorts in a way to force him to take several long, careful breaths. She didn't have a clue, he decided, what it had done to his unusual, well-disciplined hormones to have her trim little butt snug back against him. What it did to the unusual modern temperature of his blood to have all that long, bare leg brushing against his. She might be a mother, a fact that he reminded himself of often to keep dark and dangerous thoughts at bay, but as far as he was concerned, she was nearly as innocent and unaware as she'd been at fourteen. When he first began to have those dark, dangerous thoughts about her, he stopped himself from acting on them. For God's sake, she'd just been a kid, and the man with his past had no right to touch anyone so unspoiled. Instead, he'd been her friend and had found contentment in that. He thought he could continue to be her friend, and only her friend, but just lately those thoughts had been striking him more often and with more force. They were becoming very tricky to control. They both had enough complications in their lives, he reminded himself. He was just going to mow her lawn, maybe help her pull some weeds. There was time he'd offer to take them into town for some ice cream cones. Aubrey was partial to strawberry. Then he'd have to go down to the boatyard and get to work. Since it was his turn to cook, he'd figure out that little nuisance. But mother or not, he thought as Grace leaned over to tug out. Stubborn dandelion, she had a pair of amazing legs. 
Grace knew she shouldn't have let herself be persuaded to go into town, even for a quick ice cream cone, made adjusting her day's schedule, tuning in to something less disruptible than her gardening clothes, and spending more time in Ethan's company when she was feeling a bit too aware of her needs. But Aubrey loved these small trips and treats, so it was impossible to say no. It was only a mile from into St. Chris, but they went from quiet neighborhood to busy waterfront. The gift and souvenir shops would stay open seven days a week now to take advantage of the summer tourist season. Couples and families strolled by with shopping bags filled with memories to take home. The sky was brilliantly blue and the bay reflected it, inviting boats to cruise along its surface. A couple of Sunday sailors had tangled the lines, their little, su tangled the lines of their little sunfish. Let the sails flop, but they appeared to be having the time of their lives despite the small mishap. Grace could smell fresh frying, candy melting, the coconut sweetness of sunblock, and always, always the moist fragrance of the water. She'd grown up on this waterfront, watching boats sailing them. She ran free along the docks in and out of the shops. She learned to pick crabs at her mother's knees, gaining the speed and skill needed to separate out the meat. That precious, a precious commodity that would be packed and shipped all over the world. Work hadn't been a stranger, but she'd always been free. Her family had lived well, if not luxurious. Her father didn't believe in spoiling his women with too much pampering. Still, he'd been kind and loving even though set in his ways. He never made her feel that he was disappointed that he had only a daughter instead of sons to carry his name. In the end, she disappointed him anyway. Grace swung Aubrey up on her hip and nuzzled her. Busy today, she commented. Seems to get more crowded every summer. But Ethan shrugged it off. They needed the summer crowds to survive the winters. I heard Big Ham's going to expand the restaurant. Fancy it up, too, to bring more people in year round. Well, he's got that chef from up north now and got himself re re reviewed in the Washington Post magazine. She jiggled Aubrey on her hip. The inner rest is the only linen table restaurant around here. Spiffing it up suit should be good for the town. We always went there for dinner on special occasions. She set Aubrey down, trying not to remember that she hadn't seen the inside of the restaurant in over three years. She held Aubrey's hand and let her daughter tug her rest relentlessly toward Crawford's. This was another standard of St. Chris. Crawford's was for ice cream and cold drinks and take-out submarine sandwiches. Since it was new and the shop was on a brisk business, Grace ordered herself not to spoil things by mentioning that they should be eating sandwiches instead of ice cream. Hey there, Grace. Ethan. Hello, pretty Aubrey. Lisa Crawford beamed at them, even as she skillfully built a cold cut sub. She'd gone to school with Ethan and had dated him for a short, careless time. They both remembered with fondness. Now she was the sturdy, freckled-faced mother of two married to Junior Crawford, as he was known to distinguish him from his father, Senior. Junior, skinny as a scarecrow, whistled between his teeth as he ran sails, rang up sails, and sent them a quick salute. Busy day, Ethan said, dodging an elbow from a customer at the counter. Tell me, Lisa rolled her eyes, definitely wrapping the sub in white paper, and handed it along with three others over the counter. Y'all want a sub? Ice cream, Aubrey said. Berry! Well, you go on down and tell Mother Crawford what you have in mind. Oh, Ethan, Seth was in here shortly after. Shortly go with Danny Willow. I swear, those kids grow like weeds in high summer. Loaded up on subs and soda. Pop. Said they were working down to your boat yard. He felt a faint flitter of guilt, knowing that Philip was not only working, but we are riding herd on three young boys. I'll be heading down there myself soon. Ethan, if you don't have time for this, Grace began, I've got time to eat ice cream cone with a pretty girl. <laughs> so saying, he lifted Aubrey up and let her press her nose to the last front and counter that held the buckets of a hand-dipped cone choices. Liz took the next order and spared a wiggling eyebrow glance toward her husband that spoke volumes. Ethan Quinn and Grace Monroe stated clearly, Well, well, what do you think of that? They took their cones outside, where the breeze was warm off the water, and wandered away from the crowds to find one of the small iron benches the city fathers had campaigned for. Armed with fistful napkins, Grace sat Aubrey on her lap. I remember when you'd come here and know the name of every face you'd see, Grace murmured. Mother Crawford would be behind the counter reading a paperback novel. She felt a wet drip from Aubrey's ice cream, plop on her leg, while the hem of her shorts and wiped it up. Eat around the edges, honey, before it melts away. You always get strawberry ice cream, too. Hmm? Hmm? As I recall, he just said surprising that the image was so clear in his mind. You had a preference for strawberry and grape knee. 
I guess I did. Chase's sunglasses slipped down her nose as she bit the mop up some more drips. Everything was simple. If you had yourself a strawberry cone and great knee he some things stay simple. Because her hands were full, Ethan nudged Grace's glasses back up. Thought he caught a flitter or something in her eyes behind the shaded lenses. Some don't. He looked out to the water as he applied himself to his own cone. Better idea. He decided than watching Grace take those long, slow licks from hers. We used to come down here on Sundays now and then, he remembered. All of us piling into the car and riding into town for ice cream or sub, or just to see what was up. Mom and Dad liked to sit under one of the umbrella tables at the diner and drink lemonade. I still miss them, she said quietly. I know you do. That winter I caught pneumonia. I remember my mother and yours. It seemed every time I woke up, one or the other of them was right there. Dr. Quinn was the kindest woman I ever know. knew. My mama, she broke off sugar. What? I don't want to make you sad. You won't finish it. My mother goes to the cemetery every year in the spring and puts flowers on your mother's grave. I go with her. Didn't realize until the first time we went how much my mother loved her. I wonder who put them there. It's nice knowing what's being said. What some people are saying about my father would have got her Irish up. She'd have scalded more than a few tongues by now. That's not your way, Ethan. You have to tend to that business your own way. They would both want us to do what's best for Seth. That would come first. You are doing what's best for him. Every time I see him, he looks lighter. There was such a heaviness over him when he first came here. Professor Quinn was working his way through that, but he had such troubles of his own. You know how troubled he was, Ethan. Yeah, the guilt weighed like a stone. Dead corners are. I know. Now I have made you sad. She shifted toward him so that their knees bumped. Whatever troubled him, it was never you. You were one strong, steady light in his life. Anyone could see that. If I asked more questions, she began. It's not your way, she said again, and forgetting her hand. With sticky, touched it to she. You knew he would talk to you when he was ready. When he could. Then it was too late. No, it, it never is. Her fingers came lightly over she. There's always a chance. I don't think I could get from one day to the next if I didn't believe. There's always a chance. Don't worry, she said softly. He felt something more inside him as he reached up to cover her hand with his, something shifting and opening, and Aubrey let out a wild squeal of joy. Grandpa! Grace's hand jerked and dropped like a stone. All the warmth that had flowed out of her chilled. Her shoulders went straight and stiff as she turned forward again and watched her father walk toward them. There's my doll baby. Come see Grandpa. Grace let her daughter go, watched her race and be caught. Her father didn't wince her shy away from the sticky hands or smeared lips. He laughed and hugged and smacked his lips with kissed his lips when kissed lavishly. Mmm, strawberry. Give me more. He made munching noises on Aubrey's neck till she screamed with delight. Then he hitched her easily on his hip, across the slight distance to his daughter. No longer smiled. Grace, Ethan, taking a Sunday stroll. Grace thought it was dry and her eyes were Ethan offered to buy us some ice cream. Well, that's nice. You're wearing some of it now. Ethan commented, hoping to ease some of the rippling tension that moved in the air. Pete glanced down on a shirt where Aubrey had transferred some of her favorite strawberries. Clothes wash. I don't often see you around the waterfront on a Sunday, Ethan, since you started building the, that boat. I'm taking an hour before I get started on it today. Hole's finished. Deck's nearly. Good, that's good. You know what I mean, in it? Shifting his case, Grace. Your mother's in the diner. She wants to see your granddaughter. All right, I. I'll take her over. Here, you can go on home when you're ready to, and your mother will bring her on by your place in an hour or two. She would prefer he slapped her than speak to her in the polite and distant tone. But she nodded as Aubrey was already babbling about Grandpa. Bye, bye, Mama. Bye, Ethan. Aubrey called. Aubrey called over Pete's shoulder and blew noisy kisses. I'm sorry, Grace. No, it was inadequate. Ethan took her hand and found it stiff and cold. It doesn't matter. It can't matter. And he loves Aubrey. Just dotes on her. That's what counts. It's not fair to you. Your father's a good man, Grace. But he hasn't been fair to you. I let him down. She rose quickly to wipe her hands on the napkin she bailed up. And that's that. It's nothing more than his pride buttoning up against yours. Maybe, but my pride's important to me. She tossed the napkin into a trash container, told herself that was the end of it. I've got to get back home, Ethan. There's a million things I should be doing. If I've got a couple hours for you, I'd better do them. 
He didn't push. I was surprised how strongly he wanted to. He hated being nudged and nagged to talk about private matters himself. I'll drive you home. No, I'd like to walk. Really, I'd like to walk. Thanks for the help. She managed to smile that looked almost natural. In the ice cream. I'll be by the house tomorrow. Make sure you tell Seth his laundry goes in the hamper, not on the floor. She walked away, her long legs eating up the ground. She made certain she was well away before she allowed her steps to slow, before she rubbed the hand over the heart that ached no matter how firmly she ordered it not to. There were only two men in her life she had ever loved. It seemed neither of them could want her as she needed them to want her. End of chapter 3